How's it going, guys? My name is Zach with the Movie Castle, and today we're going to be continuing my Sharks of Summer series. Uh, Sharks of Summer is a series I do around here where during the summer, once a week, at least once a week, I take a look at a shark movie, and today we're going to be finishing up the Deep Blue Sea trilogy by talking about Deep Blue Sea 3. Uh, this is from 2020, directed by John Pogue, and stars Tanya Raymond, Nathaniel B Bazalik, and Emerson Brooks. In this movie, a group of scientists are studying a shark free uh, feeding zone on this remote island. However, Bella's baby sharks from the second movie swim up to this feeding ground and are starting to wreak havoc on the natural ecosystem. However, following Bella's babies is a group of shark hunters working for a mysterious company wanting to capture or kill these specimens before they wreck the natural ecosystem. But you never know if you can trust a shady company this movie brings in more of a human villain element into the Deep Blue Sea trilogy. Now overall, when you look at how the Deep Blue Sea movies are received, the first Deep Blue Sea, a classic shark movie, one of the better shark movies out there. And then we had a 20-ish year gap, and then we got two direct-to-video sequels that came out relatively close to each other. And Deep Blue Sea 2, a lot of people really don't like that movie. However, surprisingly, Deep Blue Sea 3 would kind of get a cult following. A lot of people really do love this movie, and it is definitely a step up from Part 2. All that being said, however, if I'm being completely honest, I... I don't a hundred percent get the cult following and don't get me wrong for a direct-to-video sequel that came out about 20 years after the first one this is better than we could have honestly hoped for it's a very good movie it's way better than part two it's way better than most shark direct-to-video movies and in general I think it's a good movie however I feel it does have a lot of major flaws, and I'm just, I'm not in the cult following that this movie has, and yeah, I I think it's good for a belated direct-to-video, and it's way better than part two, I just, I, I don't think it's the best thing ever, and, and if you guys like it, you know, if you're part of this movie's cult following, you know, that, that's good for you, and, and enjoy it. But I feel that there are some things that bug me about this movie, and and I guess we'll get into them. Uh, first, it, it, it's kind of slow. It really takes almost a full hour for this movie to get going. And when it gets going, it's fine. But man, it, it's an hour 40, and I really do feel like we could have trimmed at least 10 minutes out of this first hour really not much happens. There's not even a prologue kill, and in the whole first hour, it's only like two kills, and one of them's a pretty cool visual, and the other one's a really standard one, and I just feel the first hour of this movie really does drag pretty bad, and we're dealing with the characters, and the characters is another thing about this movie that I feel really does have problems. Uh, first of all, way too much focus on relationship drama. You know, you get the two intern scientists, there's like these two interns, and they have a crush on each other and they'll fall in love, and, and that's all well and good. And then the main scientist, her ex-boyfriend, is the head of the shark hunters, and it's, oh no, my ex-boyfriend, he's the bad boy. And I, I really miss the first Deep Blue Sea movie, which didn't have near this level of relationship drama in it. It's just, it's cheesy and it feels CW-esque. And speaking of CW-esque, look at some of the characters we got here. The tech guy that makes jokes all the time, the big strong guy that's really stoic in the voice of reason, and then the, the bad boy ex-boyfriend. 
These are all CW character archetypes. They're just not that great. I mean, look at the first Deep Blue Sea. Thomas Jane, LL Cool J, Samuel L. Jackson. Those were some characters there, and no one in this movie comes close to them. But that being said, sadly, the character that had, I think, the most problems was the main girl. The main girl, I, I don't know. I just, I wasn't a big fan of her character, the way they chose to write her. I mean, the actress does a good enough job playing the role that she's supposed to do. I just don't like what they chose to do with this role. She's, she's just mean. She's really mean to everybody. Um, her ex-boyfriend, who's the head shark hunter, well, when she finds out about the shady stuff the company's doing, she really yells at him, really goes to town, even punches him in the face. But the problem I have with that is he did not make the sharks. He's just trying to do his best to clean up the mess and literally save the world from an invasive species. He didn't make the evil sharks. This really does feel like, you know, that classic, you know, stereotype of a a Karen yelling at the employee for the sins of the company. And as someone that used to work retail, this really did bug me. Your boyfriend didn't make the sharks, lady. He's trying his best to fix the situation that someone else made. And then there's other things, like every now and then she'll be really rude to her interns. There's this one scene where she's like, show me the the GPS tracking history for this tracer. And the tech guy's like, I don't think I can do that. And she's like, yes, you can do it anyway. And he does, but he admits, he's like, it's not strictly legal what I did. And I'm like, lady, did you just bully your intern into committing a felony? Oh my gosh. But yeah, she will occasionally be really rude to the interns. She'll yell at her ex-boyfriend even though he's just trying to manage a bad situation. And she's really preachy. She's really self-righteous. And she just, yeah, she yells at people all the time. And there's even a scene early on in the film. The shark hunters show up and they say, there are dangerous bull sharks that are killing people and they're here at this island. And the main scientist lady goes, whatever, I'm a scientist, I have to do my work, and dives in the water after being told that sharks are eating people in the water. The, 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 the shark hunters go, don't do that, we traced bad sharks here, and she's like, I don't care, and dives in the water. And I'm like, lady, if you weren't the main character, this is where you would die. But yeah, that's a dumb decision. And there are a few other dumb elements. And like I said, this movie takes like an hour to get going. And also, it's an island. And I know the Deep Blue Sea movies had to change things up. You couldn't just make a whole series about underwater bases. But maybe we could have done a ship or a submarine or something because I wasn't a big fan of the island. You know, it's deserted, so it looks a little bit creepy, and I really wish they had pushed that farther. But the first two Deep Blue Sea movies, underwater bases had a whole ton of grunge behind them. And this movie just doesn't have that industrial grunge that an underwater base would have had. And also, with the underwater base and the thousands of gallons of water over your head, pressure both in a literal sense and in a plot sense, the underwater bases were just so much better. Again, I know we had to change. We couldn't just keep the formula going that much. But maybe a submarine or a ship? Let the Navy take on the deep blue sea sharks. That would be cool. But I just, I wasn't a big fan of the island. Above water, way too safe. Anyway, I know I did rant on the movie a little bit, but like I said, the movie's okay. It, it has major faults, but it's still a significant step up from part two, and way better than what you'd get in most direct-to-video movies. 
I'm just not in the cult following. And and if you are in the cult following, that's fine. And I, I wish I was because, you know, I love shark movies. I love Deep Blue Sea. I really am waiting for that perfect sequel. I just, I don't think this is it. You know, bring back Thomas Jane and LL Cool J. Do a proper continuation of the story. But whatever. Anyway, without further ado, I do want to analyze this movie a little bit further, so I'll go ahead and be talking about the plot. I won't be doing any major spoilers, but I do want to say my piece on a few plot points and make sure you guys have a basic understanding as to what this movie's about. Anyway, we open up, we th see three sharks heading towards this island, and that's it. Like, there's no prologue kill. You're supposed to hook us with a big action scene, show us something crazy, think the uh, the shark fin hunters in part two, but in this, the sharks just swim up to the island and they don't kill anybody yet. It's a missed opportunity. You really needed that adrenaline shot at the beginning. But anyway, what do we get instead of that? Well, we cut to our main character and she's vlogging. Never. It's not as bad as a lot of other vlogging characters in movies, but admittedly when I saw this, I did groan a little bit. And after a bit of vlogging, she explains the island that they live on. This island used to have, I think they said 800 people on it, but now there's only two full-time residents other than the scientist. And it's uh, because of rising sea levels. The, the dang global warming got our island. And, and that being said, the concept is not sold super well. Because I looked at the island and I'm like, it, it looks in disrepair and it looks abandoned. But it doesn't look sinking. If you want to tell us this island's sinking, have the water come up to their ankles. Show us the roofs of buildings underwater. But it looks like just a perfectly fine island, yet they say it's uh, it's been ravaged. You know, it just looks like everybody left. You know, so show us the sinking state of the island. Maybe have a room that's collapsed and going under. But also, it, one thing about this is the island has bad structural integrity, pro, uh, structural integrity, and in turn they say don't shoot any guns because a bullet could knock down a whole section of buildings, yet a angry shark that weighs hundreds of pounds can't. Uh, but anyway, they say it has bad structural integrity, and then that gets me thinking. It's a man-made island with bad structural integrity, and it's sinking. I think blaming this on global warming is a case of confirmation bias. It's it's just breaking apart. It just needs repairs. I don't know. Again, if you wanted to ride it where global warming's doing it, ride it better. Anyway, uh, she goes in the water, and we get a section of, you know, seeing fish around a coral reef and explaining that this is an important shark feeding ground. And it is beautiful, well-shot photography, but it feels more like I'm watching an ocean documentary than a shark horror movie. And it goes on, to be honest, a little too long. But she's talking about the fish and stuff when a shark swims up to her. And she goes, oh, hey, this is my shark friend. I knew her since she was a pup. And the other scientist is like, that's a shark. Stay away from it. And she's like, no, it's fine. It's my shark friend. And then the shark just rams her and pushes her into something and she bleeds and they have to leave. Very strange decision. A, this isn't the bull sharks that will give them problems later. So I don't know why it was mad. But also having your main character in the beginning go, sharks are nice. Ow. That just makes her seem like an idiot. And, you know, maybe if you had a different character do this, you could have preserved the main character a little better. But just having her get owned by a shark in, like, the first scene that she's in, that's not a smart move to make your main character seem like the genius you want her to be. I don't know. You write her better if you want us to, you know, don't, don't have her get attacked by a shark, you know? Anyway, whatever. 
Uh, they go back to the island. You get a sense of island life. You get to meet the two residents that are still there from before. And to be honest, these characters are so underutilized. They're probably interesting enough characters, but I swear at times the writer forgets that they're part of a, the story. I would love to see these two more developed, but they are pretty shoved to the back. And then you get the two interns in love, her other scientist, and they're there hanging out, eating dinner, and eventually a boat will come up, and it's not any boat that they know. And it is full of shark hunters working for a mysterious company, and the head shark hunter is her ex-boyfriend from college. And he talks about how they've seen these sharks and they're trying to track them down, and we find out that on the ship, she ha uh, her ex-boyfriend has the dead body of Bella. You see, Bella, the mother shark from part two, was leading her babies to the food source that's this island, and she got tangled up in a fishing net and died. What? She's your lead shark, and you kill her off between movies, and you don't kill her off in any cool way, she just gets tangled up in a net and dies? I thought she was a hyper-intelligent shark, and she just dies by getting tangled up in a net? I was really hoping that they were building up Bella to be like the alien queen of sharks, and they kill her off between movies and not in any cool way. So that sucked. But her pups are all grown up now. The baby sharks from part two, they're all grown up, and they're heading towards this island, and it's going to be big trouble for them. After a fair bit of shark hunting, they do get one of the brothers, and the other two start to bang on the ship and almost sink it. Again, they're strong enough to almost sink a ship in this island with structural integrity problems. They're not going to sink that. But anyway, in order to get them to stop sinking the ship, the ex-boyfriend holds a gun up to the shark that they've caught and said, leave or I'll kill this one. And the two sharks leave. And the main scientist lady is like, okay, how did that happen? The shark shouldn't be that smart. And he explains what they're doing. You know, we already knew that he wasn't just hunting random sharks because he knew Bella's name. Uh, but he explains that uh, the research for the degenerative brain diseases in part one led to the research to the hyperintelligence in part two, and he's worked for a company that's bought all the patents and wants to grab these sharks up in order to make more super smart medicine. It's good that they tied the first movies together in with this one, because two really did seem unrelated, and now they feel more like a trilogy. But that being said, unless it's just in concept, I don't see how any of their work could be descendants from one another because in both the first two Deep Blue Sea movies, they made a big deal about how all the data got destroyed, you know? There was that disc that got electrocuted in the first one, and then in the second one, did you back it up to the cloud? No! So I don't know how they're continuing the research when both times it got destroyed, but whatever. Anyway, after all this comes out, they try shark hunting for a little more, when eventually the second-in-command, uh, the second-in-command shark hunter, just decides that their corporate bosses would probably just be okay with murder, and decides to, you know, attack everybody. You know, man is the real monster. Or maybe it's just, man is cheaper than a CGI shark. Eh, it's a little... A little forced, you know. I is guy is is nuts, and he's an okay villain. It's just uh, I, I don't think your bosses would really want you to murder people. But anyway, then we eventually finally get to the action, and we finally get to the explosions and the crazy shark stuff. And again, when this movie finally gets going, it does finally get going. And there is some fun stuff. You know, there's a good kill where a shark bites someone and they had those little uh, things that pull scuba divers and you see them just getting drug along. There, there's some fun, cool moments, some cool ideas. But like I said, 
This movie has major problems. It takes too long to get going. It doesn't have the grunge because it's on an island. And it also doesn't have the tension because it's on the island. And the characters are just stock CW characters. And the, and the main lady is really mean. So overall, I wasn't a huge fan of this one. I did think it was a good direct-to-video sequel to a movie that came out 20 years later. It's better than Part 2 uh, by far, and it's better than most direct-to-video shark movies. It's just, I feel this movie has massive problems, and I, I, I like it, but I, I'm just, I, I'm not in the cult following for this movie, sadly, and I do wish I was. Deep Blue Sea 1 is a classic, and I really do want a really good sequel to Deep Blue Sea. I really want them to bring back LL Cool J and Thomas Jane, but that would require a lot more of a budget. But I really do want to see a really good Deep Blue Sea movie. This is a step in the right direction, but I just don't feel like we're there yet. Anyway, to everyone who's watched so far, thank you for watching. To everyone who's liked and subscribed, thank you. You really are helping the channel out. I'll leave a relevant playlist on the bottom. This should be my Deep Blue Sea playlist. If you want to see me talk about the first two movies, you can find those right there. Anyway, have a good day. I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Relevant playlist on the bottom. Have a good day now.